It's said that in the 1910s in London, Cockney rhyming slang paired dog's meat with feet, and the term dogs meaning feet was born. Well, it's come full circle because this is the mongrel canine. G'day, welcome back to Bootlosophy. My name is Tech. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land and waters that I live on, the Wajit people. Today, I'm introducing you to my dogs. No, not my own feet, but these dogs. The Mongrel K9 uh, Aussie Chelsea boots made by Mongrel Boots. Such a quintessential name for an Aussie boot company, ya mongrel. <laughs> but hey, before I go on with this review, I wanted to shout out to Ryan, who started a boot review channel called Yushu, Y-O-U-S-H-O-E, on YouTube. He's only been going uh, for a few months, but I like what he does. Go check him out. I'll leave a link to his channel in the description area below. Back to these boots. If you know your Blundstones and your Redbacks, um, two of the more well-known Aussie work boots out in the world, you may recognize this design from the world of Australia's work boots in safety or non-safety toe form uh, and used by Aussie tradespeople, uh, workshop and factory workers, builders and contractors, farmers, um, uh, great wine growers and pastoralists. It is a Chelsea boot from the same family tree as invented by Queen Victoria's bootmaker, uh, sleeked up by the costume designer for the Beatles, worn by every self-respecting 60s pop group, worn as a work and riding boot in the uh, British colonies then of Australia, New Zealand, South Africa and India, uh, and made expensive and acceptable in the boardroom by RM Williams. If you want a detailed history of the Chelsea boot, go take a look at my review of the RM Williams Craftsman up there. It is instantly recognisable as a six inch high pull on laceless boot kept on your feet by these elastic side panels called goring and easy to pull on because of, uh, in Australia at least, two cloth pull tabs at the front and rear of the collar. The cheap Australian work boot, the Blunnies, the Redbacks, uh, the Rossies and these Mongrels have the same characteristics of that uh, side branch of the Chelsea family. Generally extremely lightweight because they're not welted, uh, stubby round nose made of rugged distressed or new buck or kip leather uppers uh, and set on a soft TPU one-piece sole. The whole sole construction of this pair uh, is a lot slimmer and sleeker than comparable work boots so it helps with that casual vibe. I'm not even going to bother talking about styling them because they are clearly casual jeans and uh, work pants driven boots worn with very casual clothes, you know, t-shirts, work shirts, that sort of thing. These K9 boots by Mongrel, however, are slightly different in the design of the last in that they've been sleeked up by the uh, work boot manufacturer and intended to be worn casually rather than on the work site. They actually came out only a couple of years ago and are available in black oil kip, uh, claret oil kip, vintage brown and this cloudy grey. I'd suggest that most of my overseas friends will have heard of Blundstone and more re recently as Blunnies have become more expensive overseas they've heard of Redbacks. But I'd also suggest that not many may have heard of Mongrel Boots. In fact, Mongrel Boots uh, is a sister brand of Redbacks owned by the same family. Stanley Kloros, a Greek fisherman and bootmaker, emigrated to Australia in the 1900s and by 1930, he had started a bootmaking business in Sydney. His son William, or Bill, started working with him and during the Great Depression, Bill had the foresight to buy up bootmaking machinery from liquidation sales as many Aussie bootmakers, and there were many of them at the time, went to the wall uh, during the 1930s. As the economy got better, he started his own boot factory under the banner of the Victor Boot Company. Like many bootmakers in the late 1930s and the 1940s around the world, they joined the war effort and made service boots for the Aussie troops fighting in North Africa and the Pacific. In the 1950s, Bill handed over the business to his sons and the company was then renamed Victor Footwear. In 1989, Victor Footwear launched the Redback brand and in 2000, the Mongrel brand was launched as well. They remain family owned and still make Redbacks and Mongrels in Sydney, 
making work boots for Aussie construction workers, miners, farmers and pastoralists. They make zip-sided safety work boots, um, steel toe lace-up boots and a full range of elastic-sided Chelsea boots. I'll leave a link below to both the Mongrel and the Redback sites. Now, uh, you might want to take a look at my review of the Redback here and compare what they look like uh, when you compare them to these. I'll also leave you a link to the online store Everything Australian, which I believe services overseas customers and has the best customer service too. I have no relationships with them, by the way, uh, just that uh, I've bought lots of my Aussie boots uh, off them and I've received the best advice on, on fit and stuff. Let's get to the construction. The K9 starts with a new streamlined Chelsea Last. A last is that foot-shaped mole on which the leather is stretched and lasted to make the shape of that boot that is distinctive to that uh, last design. The K9 last is slimmer in the toe box and lower profile when seen from the side. Their marketing aims these boots at the off-work casual market. I assume intended to uh, eat into the Blundstone market since Blunnies have, at least over the last 10 years or so, uh, become the darling of the hipster crowd as an after-work casual boot, especially overseas. Uh, my builder and tradie friends still wear them as work boots, but you can't deny a trend, especially overseas, to wear Blunnies as a fashion boot. You can see why from my review of my Blundstones here. The lasting of the K9, like all the other Aussie Chelsea work boots, is done by machine in a factory. The sole is also machine installed and is heat welded on and not stitched. Once the uppers are lasted around a fiberboard footbed, a tube of hot polyurethane or PU is squeezed into a mold and while still hot, pressed against the footbed and then heat sealed. Another tube of thermoplastic polyurethane uh, or TPU is then squeezed into another mold and hot pressed against the cooling PU midsole. So the layers of the sole construction are a hard wearing TPU outsole, a softer squishy PU midsole, which they call their air zone comfort system, heat sealed onto the fiberboard lasting board inside and around the lasted uppers. This makes the boot highly water resistant, but they're not waterproof because the uppers leathers are not treated with any waterproofing compound. The heat sealed outsoles also make the boot totally not resolvable. Basically, once the soles are worn out, you can spend a lot of money to get these welted and resold, or you throw them away. When I tell you the price in Australia, you get why they're not resold in Australia. One other important thing about the, uh, the PU midsole, you may have heard of this, they are highly susceptible to hydrolysis. If you look up the scientific definition of hydrolysis, it's just a chemical breakdown of a compound due to its reaction with water. In this particular case, the chemical bonds of polyurethane attract water molecules in between their polymer strands, which then breaks them up. This means that in time, these TPU and PU cells will just get chunks broken off. Apparently, the best way to look after them is to use them constantly. The act of wearing them, I think the pressure of your, your weight, forces out the water molecules and helps to preserve the chemical bond. Not forever though. Leave them in a damp, humid cupboard for months and they will definitely break down faster. Both Blundstone and Mongrel or Redback have invested in technology to come up with a more durable composition of their TPU and PU blends. And in theory, at least, their newer boots are less prone to breaking up at least not as quickly as before. My reading of a lot of boring chemists' papers is that it's not possible to completely stop hydrolysis in making uh, polyurethane polymers. Having said that, amongst my builder friends, they've worn out their boots and have not reported chunks breaking off their soles, nor any other form of sole failure. So use them as intended and they'll last for as long as the whole boot lasts. Uh, the uppers is made from a grey new buff. Now, this is not the nappy nubuck you expect from, say, a Timberland boot or, or something similar. It's actually quite smoothed out, so I guess it's been buffed quite a bit more. Mongrel call this a full grain nubuck. But if you've seen my video about different leathers up here, you know that nubuck could never be technically full grain. Not because it's not a good leather, but because the surface, the grain, has been buffed to make it slightly fuzzy, so you've lost the grain. 
Full grain in its proper definition doesn't mean better leather. It just means that the grain hasn't been removed and you can see all the natural pores and scars and hair holes and veins of the animal. Uh, the leather is not very thick. It's only about one and a half millimeters thick, which partially explains the lightweight of the boot. The uppers are unlined, but securely stitched with no hard seams inside to rub your feet. The pattern is a four piece pattern. There's the vamp piece that goes up the instep, two quarter pieces, and a single piece backstay uh, covering a celastic heel counter on the inside. The toe puff is also celastic, and because the leather is thin, you can actually see where it ends. Inside the boot, they saw on a kind of felt lining at the heel, you won't be able to see it, which just provides you a bit, a bit of grip. The stitching is all machine stitched and looks very neat, very secure. Uh, everything is double stitched with the lightly contrasting grey thread. The goring is a nice tight fabric. It feels very elastic, so it shouldn't get flabby quickly. And the stitching into the leather is secure and it actually looks quite strong. I don't believe there's a shank which helps with the weight again. And to be honest, it doesn't feel like it collapses uh, your arch. That may also be, mind you, because of the hard TPU outsole giving durability and stability, almost like an exoskeleton, and coupled with the soft PU midsole giving squish and the removable uh, ortholite insole that's molded to give you a little arch support. Oh, by the way, uh, despite this being marketed as an after hours boot, a pub crawl if you like, the soles are oil and fat resistant, maybe against all that spilt beer. Now this is going to sound weird because uh, Mongrel Boots says that this is new but, but I wouldn't necessarily not condition these. But let's back up. Usually you treat new buck almost like suede. You brush it with a suede brush so that you raise the fuzziness. Uh, you remove dirt marks with a damp cloth and a light cleaner or with a suede cleaner and an eraser for spot cleaning. You can waterproof it with a suede waterproof spray, but you usually do not condition it. This is also what Mongrel's care page says about treating new buck. However, this new buck is so smooth that I'd be tempted to treat it like an oiled new buck or distressed leather uh, because there's really no nap. And if it needs it, if it needs it, I would condition it with a conditioner that's very light on oil and wax, you know, something like a big four rather than see it uh, dry and tear. But anyway, that's my opinion, caveat emptor. Looking at sizing, this is a headache. I can tell you from experience that Aussie work boots like these, uh, whether uh, these mongrels in particular, or Blundstones, or Redbacks, or even Rossies, they only come in whole sizes. Let me explain. And for what it's worth, don't bother looking at uh, sizing information on the mongrel website. Not very great. First, they use the UK sizing convention, which is one size number down from US. So if I wear US size 8.5s, I should wear these in UK size 7.5. But second, these Aussie work boots generally size properly on the full size, and their half sizes are the same length, but go up a width. Confusingly, their FAQ says that they are triple E width. I don't know in what universe. <laughs> Here is my case. In US Brannock measurement, I'm an eight and a half in average D width, but on the edge of an E. In sneakers, New Balance, I'm a size nine. In US heritage boots like Iron Ranger, uh, Wolverine, Allen Edmonds, Alden, and in, even in the newer brands like Grant Stone, Thursday, Parkhurst, I am an eight D. In UK bootmaker sizes, which are usually true to size, I'm a 7.5 in average width. In these boots, and it doesn't matter whether they're mongrels or blunnies or redbacks, while I should be 7.5, true to size, I'm actually a 7. I've tried a 7.5, same length, but the width, I'm swimming in them. I've tried 6.5, too short. That's why I've given you the Everything Australian website below. Reach out to them for sizing advice. They are good. Once you've dialed in your size though, the comfort is indescribable. People have great debates about whether red backs are actually more comfortable than Blundstones, you know, the Blundstone killer. They're gonna have the same debate about these. To me, let's be honest, <laughs> I can't tell the real difference. Around the feet, these fit me more like blunnies than red backs, I think because they're slimmer, red backs are built wide. 
Um, and I find that uh, the Redbacks have a particularly loose last anyway. These and the Bluntstones I have, the 650s, fit more snugly because of their slimmer lasts. Under the feet, I can't tell the difference. In all of them, they use the TPU-PU combination and so it's very squishy and shock absorbing while giving you a, a reasonable stability. All of them have their version of an Ortholite removable insole and to me, all of them feel the same. Nice fitting and supportive and shock absorbing. After wearing heavy, stiff, uh, welted heritage style boots, these are a pleasure to pull on and uh, go pub crawling. Okay, now uh, let's talk value. I cringe when I hear how much Blunnies sell for in America. Over here, Blunnies sell for around 200 Aussie dollars. That's about 150 US. Redbacks, yeah, about the same. These sell for less. Uh, in most uh, tradey discount stores, you can get them for around 180 Aussie or about 115 US. Tradies need to be able to afford their boots, even if they do throw them away after a few years. I got these uh, off an eBay store, brand new in box, not seconds. Uh, it's just an, a, a retailer who has an eBay store. And I got them for under 100 Aussie. They're always discounted somewhere. Now, because I don't wear my one boot every day, I don't expect to wear these uh, out in anything under 10 years. Okay, if I were a normal person, maybe, you know, two to three to four years. So that's anywhere from $20 a year to $50 a year. Now that's got to be value. And say you want to resole them. You can't just slap on a rubber sole and glue it on. Because of the original heat seal technology, cobblers try and do it but the technology uh, will not hold and you'd be wasting your time. So if you want to resole them, you'd need to find a good cobbler who can put on probably a Goodyear welt or at least a Blake stitched sole uh, uh, and Blake stitched the rubber outsole on. I got a quote once, over a hundred. It's not ecologically sound, but you see why people wear them to nothingness and then just buy a new pair. So that's it. Uh, maybe later, I'll bring you a video that directly compares these mongrel boots to the Redback boots, uh, to the Blundstone boots, and also to the Cheap Rivers Chelsea Work boots, which you can see up here. Uh, let me know if you'd like that uh, in the comments below. Anyway, I hope you like this review. Maybe your first look at mongrel boots and their sleeped up casual version, the K9. Don't forget to click on like and subscribe and help me out. Keep an eye out for more boot reviews coming up from me. Uh, make sure you subscribe to catch up with them. Take care and see you again soon. Focus on me, I'm the center of attention.